Well, uh, I welcome everybody and thanks so much for joining us for this 12th session of the End Times, Understanding the End Times. And uh, this session is titled The Apostasy, Phase 2. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And uh, we're going to start with a quick review of what we looked at in the last two sessions. And we'll jump into what we're going to talk about in this session. You know, my wife, as I was preparing, she was, we were talking. And, you know, this, this Sunday is when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. It's the end of Passover. It's Resurrection Sunday. And she was asking me, are you excited to be able to preach something other than the apostasy? It's kind of sobering. I'm like, absolutely. I can't wait to shift into another subject. But even so, uh, this really is a super important topic that we understand. Uh, and we get a really deep understanding of it. It is, you know, it is sobering, but we shouldn't let sobriety scare us away from what's true. And so, anyway, with that in mind, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And Paul is talking, and we looked, about, looked at this in the first session. Paul's writing, and in, in Thessalon Thessalonica, a lot of the believers thought, okay, the day of the Lord has come, the, the, the second coming has come. And, you know, they were all nervous and worried that they had missed the, the second coming of the Lord. And Paul was telling them, okay, calm down, calm down. The, 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 the Lord has not come back. And he said, I want to tell you, Thessalonians, what must take place before the coming of the Lord. And he said, verse 1, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and are gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed from a spirit or a message as if to the effect the day of the Lord has come. Now listen to what he says in verse 3. Let no one deceive you in any way. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come, talking about the return of the Lord, the day of the Lord, it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And so I just want to say that just real quick. The apostasy is going to come first. There is going to come an apostasy before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, we looked at that in the first session and in the second set. Well, no, I mean, the, and we looked at that in session 10 and in session 11, the apostasy, and we saw what it was about. But, uh, you know, we talked about in the last session, phase one of the apostasy is the preaching of another Jesus, the preaching of another gospel, doctrines of demons like hyper grace, preterism, uh, dominionism, and things like that. And uh, so now what we're going to do in, in this session, we're talking about phase two of the apostasy. I believe it's an increasing, just like we saw in the days of Israel, ancient Israel, when Solomon had an apostasy that then affected Jeroboam and the nation of Israel with, with presenting another Yahweh, that they were, it, it, was, it was not another God, but it was another version of that God. And then it became Jezebel and Ahab with the worship of Baal and Asherah. And so that same kind of pattern is repeating itself at the end of the age. You know, it's re history repeats itself. And I believe we're already are living in phase one of the apostasy. And that word apostasy in the Greek means a defection, a defection, an abandonment. And the apostasy, the way it works, the apostasy begins with an apostasy, a defection from truth, and then it ultimately leads to a defection from a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is sobering, really, when you think about it, that Paul is giving an apostolic warning and he's, he's declaring apostolically about what's going to happen at the end of the age. There will be an apostasy where, I don't know the number, but numerous Christians who were once loyal Christ followers are going to defect. They're going to defect from the faith of Jesus Christ. They're going to defect from the truth and they're going to turn and they're going to embrace either another Jesus, another gospel, a completely different religion. And ultimately it's going to lead to the worship of the Antichrist. That's what we're leading up to as we go through this. And so I know it is, it is a sobering reality, but it's nonetheless true that we, and we are living right now 
in I, what I believe is phase one of this apostasy, which we looked at in the last session. We are seeing, the, the, the you know, I'm not going to rehash what we talked about, but we are living in that right now. So with that in mind, I want to talk about phase two of the apostasy. Now, just to let you know a little bit, when it comes to phase one, and I've already talked about that, I think it's pretty easy to identify phase one. It's, it's, it's pretty easy to see what it is, the preaching of another Jesus, the preaching of another gospel. We're seeing it right now, even with progressive Christianity and saying that the Bible is not the authoritative word of God. Phase three, as I'm going to talk about in the next session, I also think is relatively straightforward. But phase two, just to be honest with you, is a little bit more challenging to figure out. And so as we start this, I mean, I, I do believe, I'm, I feel confident in what I'm going to share. I'm not dogmatic about it. I'm not saying, thus saith the Lord. And this is not a prophecy or even a prediction. It's more a projection of what I think it's going to be. And that's universalism, which I think is going to be. But um, I'm not dogmatic about that. I, you know, it could be something different, but I, you know, I'm going to explain why I think it is universalism. So just to kind of help us get back into that train of thought, okay, um, what exactly will phase two of the apostasy look like? And I believe it's all tied into the, the rising up of the seventh kingdom, which we've looked at extensively in this teaching. And so in the seventh kingdom, just as a quick review, is you remember Daniel saw an end time kingdom rising up. And this end time kingdom was a kingdom of iron mixed with clay. And we looked at, remember, what, were the, what was the iron? Well, the iron was the Roman Empire, the ancient Roman Empire. And so the iron mixed with clay is a partial reviving of that ancient empire. I believe it's going to be Many of the European nations that were involved in the ancient Roman Empire, they're going to be part of this seventh kingdom, along with other nations, which is symbolized by the clay. Arab nations will likely be part of this. Other nations will likely be part of this. And they're going to join together and form the seventh kingdom that is talked about in the book of Revelation, the seventh Antichrist kingdom, from which the Antichrist will eventually arise out of. And so... Anyway, this, this kingdom, if you think about it, we talked about this in, in some other uh, sessions, is this, you know, I, I think what we're seeing right now, we're in the beginnings of this kingdom rising up. I think it's only in, the, in its infancy, but it is rising up in the day we live in. I think the seventh kingdom has already begun in the European Union. It's only at the beginning of it. But I think once you add in the UN's 2030 agenda, the Great Reset, uh, inclusive capitalism and all that they want to do, the UN 17 goals of sustainable development, I believe we could see this kingdom rise up over the next decade. I, I think that's where we're at. Now, that, again, is not a prophecy. It's, it's a projection based on where we're at culturally. But I think over this next decade that uh, the globalism and the globalists are pushing to see this set up. And so part of this, part of this, seventh kingdom is, you know, we talked about this, is to unite the world, there's going to be a major push towards uh, social justice. And we got to have unity and we got to remove, we got to have equity. We got to have equality. We got to have tolerance and diversity of beliefs. And, you know, we're seeing this already in America. We're seeing it around the world right now, but this is the push towards that seventh kingdom rising up. And I believe, just like we talked about, it's going to be a hybrid of socialism and corporatism mixed with technocracy, with elite uh, technical leaders leading and eliminating of the middle class. And we, you know, I'm not going to say every detail because we've already gone into a lot of detail of that. But at the heart of the seventh kingdom, and what's going to really be the driving force of the seventh kingdom is the economy, which I believe is described in Revelation 18. And, uh, you know, we, and if you're in our Forerunner School, we showed a video that was released at the end of December 2020 of the uh, Pope pushing inclusive capitalism with some of the world's greatest business leaders. And you kind of see what this is going to look like. We're seeing that right now rising up. But at the heart of the seventh kingdom is a religion because there's no way you can unite the world. There's no way you can bring everyone 
onto the same page and create this new Tower of Babel if you don't bring in religion. Religion is the key factor. In fact, so much of division that we see in the world today is related over the issue of religion. You know, so many um, people say that whether, you know, even though it's not fully backed by stats, but it has this feeling that so many of the wars have been created and caused by religion. And, and there's some truth in that. Um, and, and so to unite the world, to have peace and safety that Paul talked about in Thessalonians, is that when they say peace and safety, then comes sudden destruction is going to come. Religion is going to be a key component. And the, the, the seventh kingdom's religion uh, in particular. Now, <clears throat> just to say this, this is very important. It's very important what I'm going to say. Satan's goal in the seventh kingdom is to prepare the way for the Antichrist. The seventh kingdom and, and the strategy of Satan is a demonic agenda to prepare the way for the Antichrist. It is a forerunner for the Antichrist. It's a forerunner for the, the final eighth empire. And so the seventh kingdom, and in particular the religion of the seventh kingdom, the, Satan's goal in this, we see it in Revelation 17 and 18, is to make the nations of the earth intoxicated with the idolatrous religion of end time Babylon coming out of Rome. And that, that, the goal of that is to weaken Christianity, weaken the authority of the word of God and exalt up or to weaken that, that authority and to then begin to exalt up the Antichrist religion. So this is a, it's a work of preparation. See, sometimes people think, okay, well, the, the, you know, Satan, his ultimate goal is to raise up atheists. You know, if, if Satan could just have atheists, he would be, that would be what would make him happy. And I don't believe that's true at all. I don't believe that's true at all. In fact, when you study the end times, what you really see is there is going to be a revival of religion. We are going to see a revival of religion. And, you know, we live in a postmodern world right now where, you know, kind of religion has is, is been pushed out of the culture. And we don't want religion in our culture. But I'm, I believe as we head into the second coming, towards the second coming of Jesus Christ, we are going to see a great awakening released by the Holy Spirit that's going to bring, prepare the bride for Jesus Christ. And we are going to see a great awakening, even in the, even in the, even by uh, led up or energized by the enemy, that wants to bring out religion. And I believe we see that in Revelation 17 and Revelation 18. And ultimately, the the enemy's goal is to get what he's always wanted, and that's worship. The enemy, from the very beginning, has wanted worship. That's why he rebelled against God. He wanted the worship that belonged to God alone. That's why he said, I will raise my throne above the stars of heaven, and I will exalt my throne above the, above the throne of God. And so the enemy wants that worship, and he wants to eliminate every rival of every competitor to that worship. And so that's why... At the beginning of the Great Tribulation, the Antichrist and the Ten Kings are going to destroy the city of Rome. They're going to bring down the Seventh Kingdom and the religion of the Seventh Kingdom. And they're going to bring forth the Eighth Kingdom, which is going to be a religion that has absolutely no tolerance. We're going to talk about that in the next session. But my point is this, is, is through this we understand if we can identify the Seventh Kingdom and we can identify the religion of the Seventh Kingdom, then we can understand more what this apostasy is going to look like that Paul was describing and Paul was talking about. So now we come to the question of identifying the seventh kingdom. And so in Revelation 17 2, John was looking, and if you have your Bibles, just go ahead and turn to Revelation 17 verse 2. John is looking in <clears throat> Revelation 17 2, and the angel of the Lord the angel says to him, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Again, we know it's a harlot. This city is a harlot because she promotes false religion. And we, we go through, we see the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality with her. And those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. 
And so here we see that this harlot is making the earth drunk just before the great tribulation commences. And so this harlot is intoxicating the nations. This harlot is making them drunk. And so we, you know, we know that this is a religion that is intoxicating them. The harlot's religion is intoxicating them. The harlot's religion, just like alcohol does to the brain, it, it, it brings down the ability to reason. It brings down sound judgment. The harlot, through her religion, through her intoxicating drink, is going to bring down the ability of the nations to reason, the ability of the nations to think logically, and they're going to just fully go on board with what the enemy is doing. Now, having said that, we know from, and I won't go into the detail here, but we know from previous sessions, my conviction, my belief, is that Revelation 17 and 18 is describing the city of Rome and I've, I've gone through and said why I believe that. I'm not going to say it again here. But it's the city of Rome. And we know the city of Rome is home to the Vatican, the Pope, and the Catholic Church. Now, in saying that, let me just say I believe there are millions of born-again believers in the Catholic Church. M millions of born-again believers who are Catholic. So it's not a slam against any of those. I'm talking about the, the system as a whole. The Catholic Church as a whole is going to be used at the end of the age by the enemy, just like the Catholic Church has been used for, for centuries, going all the way back to Constantine in 313 AD, that, you know, just throughout history, just study the Catholic Church, study the, the worship of Mary, which is actually the Queen of Heaven, study the, the doctrines the Catholic Church teaches, uh, and you'll realize, okay, for, for centuries, the Catholic Church has been promoting doctrines of demons that are not found in Scripture. And so I believe we, we, know for, we know for certain that this, or I'm going to say I believe with certainty that the religion of the seventh kingdom will have a version of apostate Christianity promoted by the Pope, promoted by the Vatican, coming out of the city of Rome. Now, the question then is, okay, is it only apostate Christianity and I, I believe the answer to that question is no. I don't, I don't think it is only apostate Christianity. I think it's universalism. And I've explained that in a previous session, but I think it's universalism. I think it's going to be, be the merging together of apostate Christianity, Islam, and Judaism into a one-world religion in, in the effort to unite the world. And so what I want to do right now is I want to explain why I believe, four reasons why I believe is this, this religion that's going to come out of this harlot, this end time Babylon is going to be universalism. Um, I've got a lot more detail in the notes and I would recommend you to, if you're watching this, to make sure you dig into the notes. You can get them, there should be a link on our uh, website on the YouTube video or whatever to get the notes, but I would encourage you to really get in and uh, dig into the notes because I go into a lot more detail than I'm going into even this video, but four reasons why I believe the one world religion will be universalism. And that's the, this idea that no matter what religion you worship no, no, or cling to, no matter if you're a Christian or Muslim or a Jew or a Hindu or a Buddhist, you know, there's, there's many ways, ways to God. There's many approaches to God for different tribes and nations and people. You know, and how, how bigot, you're such a bigot if you don't believe that, there, you know, uh, that this, is, this way is valid or that way is valid. And so I believe this, this idea of universalism is going to increase. We're already seeing it right now, but I believe it's going to increase in the days ahead. And there's four reasons why I believe that. Number one is if you think about it, if, if the enemy really wants to unite the world, if the enemy really wants to make the nations drunk with false religion, this religion must have universal appeal. It must have global appeal. That's the, the first thing. They must have global appeal. And so, you know, right or wrong, most people believe that the source of all global conflict today is religion. Now, when you, you know, there's obviously some truth behind that. When you factor in the Middle East wars, when you think about the Crusades, the Inquisitions, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, 9-11, you think about all those different things, all of those wars were fought over religion. 
And so the idea is if we're going to have peace, if the world is going to be united, if we're going to have peace and safety in the nations, then we've got to come onto the same board religiously because religion is a source of many wars and conflicts and divisions. I mean, if you think about it, religion gets, is even more of a, a source of division than politics, race, uh, sexual identity, gender. It, uh, religion is, is even more of a source of division because when you get into religion, it, it defines your worldview. It defines what you think about eternity. So it really does create this whole us versus them kind of mentality. And so the, the leaders of this seventh kingdom are going to real, they, they're going to realize, they know this, that those, the, if we're going to unite the nations, if we're going to bring a, a, a rebuilding of the Tower of Babel, let us come together and build a tower unto heaven that, will re, that we may, uh, let's, let us come together and build a tower that will reach into heaven. We, you know, at the very core of this is, has to be a common ground in religion. And that's why I believe universalism is, universalism is what, what it's going to be. Because... It must have global appeal. And it must also, you know, religion is going to be vital because Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.3, he said that before the coming of the day of the Lord, there is going to be peace and safety. There's going to be peace and safety. And if you think about it, peace and safety will only be possible if there is some kind of unity among religions. And so this religion, it must have global appeal. It must unite the masses. It must embrace tolerance and diversity of beliefs. It, you know, and by all means, there could be no bigotry in this religion. Now, the other thing is this religion must align with relativism. The idea or the belief that truth and morality are not absolute and they are defined by the culture and the history and the context in which you live. So this religion must have this, this moral relativism that this, this truth is relative, it's not absolute. And so I believe universalism is going to, we're going to see this, this trend begin to increase. I believe we're going to begin to see it increase. It's already on the rise. I believe we're going to see it increase substantially in the next couple of years. That the, the key to uniting the nations and uniting the world is universalism. So if you think about it, there's something like 2.3 billion Christians and 1.8 billion Muslims. This, this world religion has got to appeal to over, and that's about half the population. This one world religion has got to appeal to half, I mean, it's got to appeal to Christians and Muslims. So I believe it's definitely going to have Islam and Christianity, and I also believe Judaism as well. The second thing that I, the second reason why I believe universalism will be the one world religion is that it, I believe this religion is going to be instrumental in aiding the Palestinian Jewish conflict, allowing the Jews to rebuild the temple, allowing the Jews to reinstitute temple sacrifices. And, you know, we've looked at this in a lot of detail in this class, but it's so important. Daniel's 70 week prophecy that that last 70th week, the last seven years of that cycle of 490 years, the Antichrist, who at that time will be the, leady, the leader of the seventh kingdom, is going to make a peace treaty with the Arabs and the Jews. And that peace treaty is going to be a seven-year peace treaty that's going to allow the Jews to uh, resume their temple sacrifices. So assuming that the temp sometime before that, the Jews would have been able to be able to uh, have rebuilt their temple, and, their, and, and then that covenant then allows the sacrifices to continue. Now, if you have studied the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and you've looked into that, you know that if the Jewish people try to institute temple sacrifices right now, World War III would break out in a second because the third holiest site of Islam is the Dome of the Rock and the al Aska Mosque on that Temple Mount where the Jews believe, and it's, you know, archaeologists believe that the Temple Mount is that place on the Western Wall in Jerusalem. And so if they tried to do that now, this, we would see a, an entire war break out. I mean, just even the, the slightest little things the Jewish people do create such conflict. But something's going to change. Something has to change to, to influence the Muslims, to influence the Jews, and to influence the, 
the international community, and I believe what's going to happen, it's going to be this universal, this universalism propaganda. And just like we've seen over the last decade, the propaganda of the LGBTQ agenda to where, you know, 10 years ago, it was unthinkable to, that this, you know, this lifestyle would be accepted and normalized. We're now 10 years later. I mean, you're looking at like Hallmark movies have it, the LGBTQ agenda, the commercials have it. I believe that was from just a long period of this narrative being pushed of trying to come against bigotry and stuff like that. You're going to see the same type of, of agenda, same type of narrative pushed against that religion being an exclusive way to God, like Christianity, saying Jesus is the only way to God. That, that is going to come under severe attack in the days of head. It already is, but it's going to increase. And I believe through this continuous propaganda, this continuous narrative being pushed, especially coming from the Pope and the Vatican, which is already happening, that it's going to begin to change the mindset of many nations, many people in nations to say, there are, more, there, are, there are many ways to God based on your culture, based on your nationality, based on who you are. Many religions coexist and lead to the same God. We're going to see that increase in the days ahead. Not only that, there's going to be a false unity movement. There's going to be a false unity movement. We're seeing that right now. Beware of the false unity movement. Now, God is going to have a unity movement that's centered around Jesus Christ. It's, centered, it's released by the life of God. He is going to have a unity movement. He is going to have one unified bride at the end of the age. But there will also be a false unity movement. This idea that, hey, we're all God's children and we need to work together and we need to eliminate poverty and we need to create equality among everyone and so forth. And anything that stands in the way of that unity is going to be branded as hate speech. We're seeing it right now. Cancel culture is going to spread out so that if you are, if you are a, a born-again Christian that says Jesus Christ is the only way, you're going to be looked at as a religious bigot. And so we're going to see that increase. We're going to see that, that propaganda increase until finally the international community, the Muslims and the Jews and the Christian world and so much of the nations are going to be persuaded to say, hey, you know what? All of these religions, they really do worship the same God. And that's going to give way to, uh, it's going to give way, it's going to pave the way, prepare the way for this agreement the Antichrist will sign that allows the Jewish people to rebuild or to reinstitute temple sacrifices on the Temple Mount. That's why I believe the second reason. The third reason is the harlot religion, and I said this earlier, is, is, a, is a forerunner for the Antichrist intolerant religion. So the harlot religion is a forerunner. The harlot religion prepares the way for the Antichrist intolerant religion. We got to understand Satan has a strategy with harlot Babylon. It's to make the nations drunk. It's to intoxicate the nations with lies, with doctrines of demons. It's to create this whole narrative that, that, the, that every religion, Judaism and Islam, is the same as Christianity. You really worship the same God. The Quran and the Bible, they're basically the same. They get you to the same place. It's the same God. To make the nations intoxicated, to make them drunk, with that wine of Babylon, because the enemy wants to, the enemy is seeking to prepare the way for the Antichrist intolerant religion. Now, I believe, and I'm going to pr prove, and I'm going to go through in great detail in the next session why I believe the Antichrist could very well be a Muslim and Islam could very well be the religion of the Antichrist. I'm going to go into great detail on that in the next session. And now, if that's true, then universalism, see what it's going to do, this, the strategy of the enemy in universalism is to weaken Christianity, to weaken the authority of God's word, that is, the word of God is not spirit-inspired, the word of God is in, is, is, has errors in it, the word of God is not spirit-breathed, it's not the final authority, it's just 
this idea of humans trying to define God in their own best terms. I mean, that stuff's already being said, but it's going to increase. The enemy's strategy is to weaken the authority of God's word and to bring down the stronghold of Christianity so the nations begin to think Islam and Christianity worship the same God. Now, I'll go through that in the next session in more detail, but let's just assume for a minute Let's just assume for a minute, just think about that. Assume for the minute that, that the Antichrist's religion is in fact Islam. What you're seeing from the Pope right now, and I, we should, you know, you've, you've probably seen that video in 2016 where Pope Francis released that video of a Buddhist, a Muslim, a Jew, and a Christian uh, worshiping together and basically saying, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus Christ, I believe in Allah, I believe in Buddha. And the idea was... was um, we are, we are all God's children, and the, the, all paths lead to God. And so what I believe the strategy of the enemy is preparing the nations, making them drunk, so to speak, so they will accept the religion of the Antichrist at the, at the beginning of the Great Tribulation. There's a strategy there. There's a strategy there. And I believe that just like, just, I believe just like as we're living right now in this, I, this age of cancel culture, you know, in, in America, in America, in, the, in 2020, we saw great civil unrest come into our nation. And we saw really a Marxist strategy released of oppressed versus oppressor to, say, to try to create racial tension and racial conflict. My belief is you could possibly see a similar type, Marxist type strategy of, of justice in the area of religion that could, that could very well come in the next few years. And the idea is this, the idea is, is, is to brand Christians as the oppressors. They're the ones who are religiously bigoted. They're the ones whose Bible is full of hate speech. Their Bible is... The Word of God is actually the source of hate speech. The Word of God, the Bible, is, you know, creates this, this bigotry towards homosexuals or transgenders. Not only that, the Bible creates this bigotry towards other religions. You know, they think they're the only ones going to heaven. They're the only way to heaven. And so they're the oppressors. The oppressed are those who believe that there's many ways to God. The oppressed are those who, who worship in a different way than, than Christianity and Jesus Christ. The oppressed are those who believe that LGBTQ is acceptable in the eyes of God. And so this idea of oppressed versus oppressor, this strategy, I believe, we're going to see this employed in the next, in the, in the coming decade, we're going to see this employed to bring about this weakening of Christianity. In fact, I mean, we're already are seeing that, but that's the, the target, the enemy's target is to weaken Christianity, to raise up the Antichrist religion. And then the fourth thing, the fourth thing we see, or the fourth reason I believe universalism will be key in, or will be the religion of the seventh kingdom is because we see strong evidence of the Pope and the Vatican doing this right now. And, and again, I, I've said, I've shared about this video in 2016. I won't go into the details again, but the idea is that whether you, whether you worship Buddha or Jesus Christ or Allah or Judaism, whether you, whatever religion you're in, it all leads to the same path. All roads lead to God. I, you know, and this, this video was showing the different worshipers saying, I believe in love. I believe in love. I believe in love. And the idea being communicated is, if you believe in the absolute authority of Jesus Christ and the absolute authority of God's word, and you believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to God, I, like Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, that no man comes to me except, no man comes to the Father except through me. If you believe that, th and then you don't have love in your heart. There's a, there's a real psychological message here, psychological warfare going on that says, if you have that believe in those absolutes, you don't have love. And so the idea is to get the world thinking that Christians don't have love because they believe in the absolute of Jesus Christ. Now, the other, the other thing that I want to mention here is in session nine, I mentioned the Pope went to 
uh, United Arab Emirates, and he met with Muslim leaders. So it was a meeting of interfaith leaders, the Pope meeting with Muslim leaders. And at this meeting, they established what's called the Abrahamic Family House. And it, what it is, it's going to be this, this really incredibly architected built a complex, worship complex, that's going to have a, a, a mosque, a synagogue, and a church. It's going to have this mosque, synagogue, and church in, uh, in the United Arab Emirates. It's, it's uh, supposed to open in 2022. So we're looking at next, sometime next year, this is supposed to open. So we're seeing definitely a trend towards this universalism. And, and this is not just like some random people doing this, hey, this is a good idea. This is, this is being uh, led by the religious leaders of, of Christianity, the Pope, and Islam. And so we're seeing this trend already, and I believe we're going to see it grow in the days ahead. So, and, and also, there's another one that's opening in, in Berlin, and they're, they're breaking ground on May 27, 2021. So in about a month, a little over a month from now, it's called the House of One in Berlin, where they're going to build a sanctuary, a, mo a church, a mosque, and a synagogue. So you're seeing these kind of things begin to trend upward, universalism. And so th that's kind of what I believe. This is what I believe. This is where things are headed. This is where things are going, is, is this, this move towards universalism. Now, if you think about this, if you think about this, you know, I, I, not, like I said, I believe Rome is the harlot city of Revelation 17 and 18. But I also believe Jerusalem at the end of the age will also be, and I'm, this is before the Antichrist, or it will happen before the Antichrist, Jerusalem also will be a harlot city. It's not the harlot city of Revelation 17 and 18, but it is a harlot city. In fact, Jer uh, Isaiah is talking in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 21, and Isaiah, if you read the whole context, if you read the context of the book, Isaiah says how, talking about Jerusalem, how the faithful city has become a harlot. How the faithful city of Jerusalem has become a harlot. I think one of the, one of the major end time harlot cities at the end of the age is going to be Jerusalem. Again, I don't believe Jerusalem is the harlot of Revelation 17 and 18, but there will be major centers of harlotry around the nations, and Jerusalem will be a key one. Because if you think about this, if you think about if the, the Antichrist does allow, or that peace treaty allows the Jews and the Muslims to worship on the Temple Mount, and then you also, if you've been to Israel, you know the city of Jerusalem is segmented into four different quarters, the Armenian quarter, the Muslim quarter, the Jewish quarter, and the Christian quarter, is, is you know that that it already has everything in place to be this merging of universalism. And so even John, when he was talking in Revelation 11, chapter, uh, verse 8, he says, the great city, talking about, the, talking about Jerusalem, the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. And so I, I believe that Jerusalem could, could very well be a key harlot city at the end of the age. But that doesn't mean God's going to leave the harlot city intact. God has great plans for Jerusalem. If you continue reading Isaiah, you see God is going to purify Jerusalem with fire. God is going to baptize Jerusalem in fire. And he's going to bring forth out of Jerusalem a remnant out of this that's going to be, go into the millennial kingdom. I won't go into detail on that, but just to say that. So basically the point is this is we are coming into a time, I think we've already arrived, where strong delusion is coming. Strong delusion is coming, and it's so important. I'm telling you, it's so important that we know with clarity what the Bible teaches. It's so important that we know with clarity what the Bible teaches about the end times, which are becoming more apparently the times in which we live. And so... Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.3, while they are saying peace and safety, destruction is going to come suddenly. And so I just want to just say, you know, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ, I want to just say this to you. Be aware of universalism. Be aware of the strategy of the enemy in universalism. See, the enemy is a master at psychological warfare. 
He's a master at it. He's been doing it for 6,000 years. And so the enemy wants to manipulate that natural desire we all have as believers, as Christians, that natural desire we have to love one another and to show compassion to others and to love those who are different from us and to, to exhibit the love of Christ. You will know that I'm your, a disciple of Christ by the love you show. And so the enemy wants to prey upon that and say, if you really love people, See, if you really love people, you would accept that lifestyle. If you really love people, you would accept that religion. How can you say you love somebody and disagree with that lifestyle? How can you say you love somebody and disagree with that religion? And see, we can, it is, it, it, listen, it is possible, it is absolutely possible to love people with the love of Jesus Christ and not agree with them. It is absolutely possible to love them but not tolerate the beliefs and the practices that are contrary to the word of God. You can love someone and disagree with them. You can love someone and say what you're doing is not right. It is absolutely wrong. The scriptures are clear on that. So I would just say, let's beware of the enemy moving to bring forth a false love, false unity, false social justice movement. There's great deception in it. There's great deception in it. It's already being released right now. So many, so many people are being duped by this uh, social justice movement. And the crowning jewel of the social justice movement is the one world religion of Harlot Babylon that's coming. So just beware. It is a, it is a strong delusion. It is a strong drink. I'm telling you, I'm warning you, be aware. If you know people who are heading in that direction, warn them in the love of Christ. Pluck them out of the fire before they get too far. Be a voice that calls them out of this increasing trend towards universalism. See, watch out for those who call evil good and good evil, who call uh, light dark and darkness light. See, what is going to look so loving and so compassionate and so full of justice to most of the world, including a lot of the church? God's going to look at it and he's going to say it's full of demons. It's full of unclean spirits. I'm quoting Revelation 18, verse 2. It's energized by demons, by unclean spirits, by hateful and unclean birds. It's, it's full of demons. Be aware of this movement the enemy is releasing of wanting to create this illusion that it looks so beautiful and so glorious. In fact, when John was looking at it, John was caught up in amazement and wonder. And the angel said, John, why do you wonder? Why do you wonder? In other words, John was like, what is this? It, it can be this, it has this alluring effect to it. Beware of that rising of universalism. Beware of how it preys upon your emotions to show love. Because God, because listen, Paul gave a really sobering warning in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11. He said, God is going to send a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. So they will believe what is false. Think about that. The God of love and compassion, and he is. The God of kindness, the God of mercy, the, God, the, the great shepherd. He is going to send a great delusion upon those. How, how can that even be possible? That just seems so such like a paradox for the way we know God to be. Well, if you look at the, the verse, uh, the previous verse, before that, it's because they didn't receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. If ever there is a time to love truth, it's right now. I, you know, we got to be willing to say, it doesn't matter the price I pay. It doesn't matter the way I'm labeled. It doesn't matter how people brand me. It doesn't matter what you know, people look at me, I am going to love the truth more than I love my life. I'm going to love the truth. I'm going to stand for the truth. I'm going to speak the truth. Now, we can do that with grace, and we can do that with love, and we can do that with gentleness. We don't have to be rude in loving the truth or preaching the truth, but, 
We've got to be to this place of loving the truth because if we don't love the truth, we can be swept up in this coming delusion. Jesus gave a warning to the church of Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2. And he says, I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel. Now in that church in Thyatira, there was a woman. I don't think her name was actually Jezebel. I mean, who obviously would name their kid Jezebel? I don't think that was their act her actual name. If, if it was her name, I mean, God help there were parents to name your kid Jezebel. I don't think that was the name. I think the Lord was saying, this woman in your midst, Thyatira, who calls herself a prophetess, who is teaching and leading my bondservants astray, she is like Jezebel in the Old Testament. Now, it's interesting. The Lord said in Revelation 2, 22, it's so interesting here because I believe what the Lord does is he takes that first century church, Thyatira, and he connects that first century church with the end time church. And he says in Revelation 2.22, he says that those who commit adultery with Jezebel, now that is not physical, sexual immorality. It is idolatry. It is basically drinking the wine of her immorality, just like we see in Revelation 17 and 18. What we see here is in Thyatira, the Jezebel in Thyatira was a forerunner, a prototype of the end time Jezebel of Revelation 17 and 18. And the Lord is saying, and it's actually a warning to the church of Jesus Christ here at the end of the age, those who commit adultery with her, those who commit fornication with the woman Jezebel, those who are drunk, made drunk by her wine of universalism that's coming, that leads you into this idea that I can do anything without any consequences. The Lord is saying those who do that will go into the great tribulation. It's a warning from the Lord saying they will go into the great tribulation. I believe it's an end time warning. In fact, the, the, the word great tribulation is used only three times in scripture. The first time is in Matthew 24, when the Lord said, the great tribulation begins when the abomination of desolation begins. It's set up in the temple. And then again in Revelation uh, 7, we see a multitude, and they're coming up out of the great tribulation. So I believe the Lord is actually giving us a prototype to say the first century church, Thyatira, is very similar to the end time church that we'll see because Jezebel is rising up through in Revelation 17 and 18. That's why God, if there's a scripture verse that has been on my heart, possibly more than any other, it is Revelation 18, 4, come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people. We know, we know harlot Babylon is going to include apostate Christianity because God's people are sucked into this religion. See, I, I don't know the number. I don't know the number, but numerous Christians, I'm just looking at what's happening already in the apostasy. So many are being sucked into things that are just, uh, just absolute nonsense because we don't know the scriptures, because we don't know the word of God. And so the Lord in Revelation 18, 4 says, come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people. It's the same, it's basically different language, but the same message that the Lord said to the church in Thyatira. He says, if you commit adultery with Jezebel, you're going to go into the great tribulation. Come out of her, my people. I think just as Jezebel, if you think about it, if you look at the pattern of ancient Israel, we had Solomon and his apostasy. We had then Jeroboam and his, his taking the apostasy to another level. But then Jezebel and Ahab took the apostasy to an even greater level. I believe we're going to see the very same thing that, that, that this, this enemy, the enemy is using this to build upon uh, the preaching of another Jesus, the preaching of another gospel, the watering down of the word of God, the acceptance of uh, an immoral, immoral lifestyle, the, the idea that the Bible is just man's attempt, best attempt to describe God, not being the authoritative word of God that it really is. And so 
what I, what I, if you look on page seven in your notes, I, I created this little spectrum. I, I think what we're seeing right now in this spectrum is we see hyper grace teaching. And I talked about that in the last session. Hyper grace teaching is preparing the way for the preaching of another gospel. It's leading to the preaching of another Jesus that's not in scripture. It's leading to what is now, some are calling progressive Christianity that that basically says that the, what we see in the Bible or the Bible as actually evolving as culture changes, as people kind of evolve or whatever, that the Bible evolves with it, that is now, that is leading to universalism. And then ultimately, universalism, the wine of Babylon, is leading to the intoxic intoxication of the nations to where they accept the Antichrist and his religion, and they worship him and pledge their allegiance to him. I know that's a sobering thought, but it's, I believe it is true. I believe it's true. And so I just want to just end this session just talking a little bit about, just a little bit real quick about persecution. No one likes persecution. You know, Christians, don't, we don't want to hear about persecution. I don't want to be persecuted. You don't want to be persecuted. But I believe we're, we're coming into a time where we need to be prepared for it. I'm not saying it's going to happen, uh, you know, in the next, I don't know when it's going to happen. I do know it will happen. I don't know when. I don't know the timing. I know the Lord said to, the, to his disciples is, you will be hated by all nations. All the nations are going to hate you because of my name. And so I don't say this to try to discourage us. I don't say this to try to say, hey, you know, I'm going to mess up your day or whatever. I'm saying this because we need to be prepared for persecution. See, a lot of us in the Western world, myself included, we have never been persecuted. I mean, the, the most persecution we feel is like someone says, I didn't like your message. You were too hard or too intense or I didn't like what you said about this or that. Or, oh, no, I'm being persecuted. We, you know, we haven't really experienced persecution, but I believe as this seventh kingdom rises up, I believe as this one world religion rises up in more and more authority and more and more influence, the persecution towards Christianity is going to increase because we are going to be the enemy of the state. We're going to be the one that's looking at this thing and saying, that's full of demons. That, that is just not God. The word of God says Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father. He is the way, the truth, and the life. That is going to be called hate speech that the Bible is going to be called hate speech. You, the Bible, quoting Romans chapter 1 about the LGBTQ agenda, is going to be called hate speech. And so I just want to say we cannot back down. We have got, I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying we've got to be uh, rude or unloving or we don't use wisdom or we say things that, that are just rude and unkind or whatever. We can both speak the truth in love with grace but we cannot back down. We've got to say, Lord, whatever the cost is, if, if persecution comes, not that we seek it out, not that any of us want to be persecuted, but we've got to be prepared. I believe the church in the Western world needs to be prepared for persecution because we have got to cling to the, the authority of God's word. We've got to be a faithful witness. That's what, that's what, the, that's what it said about, that's what... Uh, John wrote about Jesus. He said he is the faithful witness. That's what Jesus said to the church in Pergamum. He says, I am the faithful witness. Antipas, my faithful witness. We want to be a faithful witness no matter the cost, clinging to truth, speaking the truth in love and in grace. And so I've got more in my notes. Uh, I would encourage you to, to look at that. So I'll just end with this. Is the Antichrist, three and a half years before Jesus comes back, Revelation 17, 16 through 17, it says the Antichrist and the ten, horn, the, the ten kings, they, they hate the harlot city of Rome and they're going to burn that city down. They're going to set it on fire and burn it to the ground. And along with that burning comes the the coming down of this one world religion of utopia, this one world universal peace, harmonious coexisting religion between 
the religions of the world, we all worship the same God. The enemy says, I will have no rival, and he burns it to the ground, and he sets up the eighth kingdom, and he sets up his intolerant religion. And so in the next session, in session 13, I'm going to go through and I'm going to go into a lot more detail of what I believe that religion is. I'm going to use scripture to support why I believe that. Amen.